back to the 25 North Presents Mutiny. Tonight, we're going to take it a little bit easier. Instead of diving in on a hard topic right off the bat, we're going to go about introducing a couple new voices to the show. So here tonight, I'll start with the returning members. You have myself, Corey. And me, Rachel. Are we introducing ourselves? Yeah. Oh, we're introducing ourselves? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, might hey. as well. New season, hey. new us. Hey, everybody. It's Jason. Not How's our going? GM. No, I'm not GMing tonight. Yeah. No, I'm going to I'm gonna try and steer this this car that has no steering wheel or, or brakes. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, with us, we have two new faces to the mutiny format. If you'd like to introduce yourselves... Hi. Hi. My name is Lunar. And Hi, I'm Lunar. here to <laughs> uh I don't know what the fuck to say. I'm silly. I don't know. Hi. How's it going, kids? How you doing? How do you do, fellow teens? Uh <laughs> you say fellow teens? Yeah, that one. Have you not seen that image where it's Oh my god, who is the actor? But he has like Steve Buscemi. Dre- yeah, Steve Buscemi. Thank you. I could not think of his name for the life of me. Uh, where he looks like a, like a teenager and he just walks up and he has a skateboard in hand and he says, how do you do, fellow teens? It makes me it's laugh. A, it's a it's one of those memes that the that the kids like. <laughs> I see. I see. Yeah. You are not I've that old. Shut up, Corey. <laughs> well, <Little> baby. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Thanks for joining us, Lunar. And the other <laughs> voice you may have briefly just heard chime in there if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Jackson, uh, otherwise known as Video Freak or Freak if you don't have much time. I'm super excited to be here and I'm I'm ready to to throw a mutiny. Who's the captain again? No one. No kings, uh, no gods. Just us. <laughs> yeah. Just the crew. Uh, just the yeah. crew. So tonight we're going to take a little bit easy and uh, talk on the subject of uh, bringing on new players to your table. And how to incorporate that in your story, how you go about it as a GM, DM, whichever variation you prefer. And if there's any tips, tricks, or anything like that, you feel like sharing at this point that you just want to throw out to the world. Ideally about, you know, the landscape of tabletop role-playing, but if you really need to know with the, you know, if you need to get the core out of an apple, you can hit it with a can and then they break in half, then this might be your time. Uh, don't try it. It doesn't work every time. Sometimes the apples just explode into about a thousand pieces. And that's how you make apple puree. <laughs> yeah, it's a mess. And then you're cleaning apples up everywhere and your mother is very not happy with you. But when it works, it's impressive. It's an oddly so. specific example. Wow. Uh, most of my examples right? are. It's like I'm pulled into a story. <laughs> I wish I could say it was th- theoretical, but, you know, I, I don't throw theories at people. I throw hard facts. Like mm. changing up a table can be hard. Scheduling can be hard, but yeah. finding that vibe and people that are interested, it can be a bit of a journey. Luckily it hasn't been too tricky for us here, but I think I want to actually go to Jason right off the hop here, just as our, our resident GM. How's it feel for you to bring new people in after 51 episodes with the stories and undertones that you've been kind of laying down previously. Is there a lot of shift or panic or is it more of a fun anticipation to see what's going to happen at the table? So I'm not, I'm not going to lie at all. I think there, there's a little bit of both. I think for any GM in my experience, at least, And I have been GMing since 1996. Dang. So I know that I was probably since a couple before a couple of y'all were born. I don't want. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I know. (laughs) It's, it's, it's tough. It's tough to lose a member because you, even if, even if that player is a problematic player, there is kind of an expectation set. And when you have to change up that expectation, change is hard. Even if it's changed for the positive, change can still be hard. 
So there is a nervous anticipation when it comes to that. So I'm not going to lie to you. It, it's there, there are some nerves there, but I think it can work. I think it can work. And in, in for us and specifically, there was a lot of prep and there was a lot of work done on my part to weave together some backstories that I was building with some of these cold opens and leveraging those backstories to weave into the main plot lines, the main threads of the overall campaign. And so losing three players, which is, which was 60% of our party was pretty, pretty tough. It was a pretty big blow, you know, that being said, I know Sarah and Cynthia have committed to still guest occasionally, so I'm not going to completely lose out on some of the plot threads that I established with Juan and Procta. We're not going to explore some of those as deeply as I had originally planned, but for some of the story hooks, at least the important beats in the story that I was working on will still be there for them. And they'll still make some guest appearances, whether that's through a surprise cold open or with, you know, an, uh, an intermission monologue by the character where, you know, we kind of flash sideways over to, Oh, what's Juan doing now along with Tessa. So I can still, you know, I can still use some of the NPCs and some of the cold open actors that I was was using for season one. I'm not planning on doing cold opens for season two. Just so I, I can get some stuff off of my plate because I was I was taking on too much and I needed I needed to take a break from that. But I still well, plan sure. on using that, using some of those actors, um, not on a regular basis, but if I need to grab. Davy Jones, for example, if I need if, if the backstory that I was working with Davy Jones and Juan Jick, which you guys can found out by the time you're listening to this, Davy was the one who flooded Juan Jick's town and Juan Jick's consciousness was uploaded to a new Android body wh- who made its way to Quent and then made a deal with Tessa and found some use and some purpose along with Tessa, which is why he was sent to the Indigo Isles as basically a, a spy for Tessa. For sure. I can use that. I can still use that. Now, bringing on new players, bringing on Timothy and an, a new character. Uh, we haven't gotten to that yet. So... Um, We'll get there. Um, bring bringing on Timothy and a new character because we've already established Timothy in a couple cold opens in season one. Yeah. So <laughs> Tim- Timothy's around, and y'all know y'all know Timothy. But by the time you listen to this, I don't think you'll have met the new character yet. So I'm not going to reveal that to you. But by the t- by bringing them in, that does open up some other story beats that I can use. So that you know, there, there's a lot of plot threads that I could that I could have used and could have done. I ended up choosing five specific ones because it worked with these with these particular characters. And but now the new characters, I can you use them. And For so sure. um, I'm looking forward to that. So nervous anticipation and kind of and this is a very long winded answer. So long story longer. <laughs> So there, there is some, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There is some sorrow, some grief in losing out on some of the work that I've put in. But there is some anticipation and some, uh, you know, some excitement, um, but being able to potentially build some new, some new plot threads with these new characters. Yeah, it's uh it's a balancing act much as everything is. And I think, 
I think it really comes down to, I'm sure, Rachel, you've run enough games to say this yourself. Sometimes characters die or players leave a game um, when you've been building towards something. And really, you just have to roll with the punches and try and be flexible as much as you can. Any any thoughts from yourself, Rachel? Yeah, I mean, um, the thing that's catching my ear that Jason's talking about is definitely the fact that any character... Like, even if you're running a pre-written adventure path, you adapt the adventure to match the backstories your players want for their characters. So you might change an NPC or change a motivation or add in a new, like, side storyline. And so then when a player dies or retires or whatever, you have to definitely think on your feet of, do I drop this storyline? Do I tied into a different character how does it affect your other characters and just I'm, I mean I'm an uh, uh, think on my feet kind of GM as Jason <laughs> knows I just make things up as I go so well and I'm sure but, there's instances for both of you where you've decided to just kind of let that sleeping plot line die and then that miraculous moment appears where all of a sudden that work you did rears its head 40 sessions later and all of a sudden has use again. So I don't think any of those plot lines are ever truly dead. It's just as long as the game's alive, the story's alive. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, you, you, you hit the nail on the head, Corey, because one of the characters that I was building a plot line with, for example you and I talked about your new character. And one of the, one of the characters I was building a plot line with could like, we could easily, we decided you and I, like it could easily be massaged into your new characters, like backstory plot line, even though like, you know, an old character is no longer with us. You could take a pre-established plot thread that I was working on and tie, and how that ties into the overarching campaign and just with you know a little bit of massage a little bit of kneading you know apply it to this new character it's it like it, it's almost like you're taking a square peg and rounding it out and sanding it out to fit into a round hole i think that's uh i think that's why they don't call it engraving or and embe- uh, we'll just go with engraving a story you're you're weaving a story exactly because um, threads tie together over time so yeah i think all that kind of ties together interestingly we've been talking a lot any of this making sense over there to you uh to you too oh yeah i'm totally Lunar jackson along. i'm uh yeah, yeah. I, i'm even thinking too like the idea of taking one character's backstory and the things you have planned for that backstory and then halfway through the campaign, that character dies. And then you have to roll a new character and this person pops up in their place. Just because that character died doesn't mean the backstory that you already planned and the organizations, the NPCs, the conflicts that you already had planned out for the character don't just go away. They just re-manifest themselves in a slightly different way. And being able to think on your feet and recontextualize those uh, pieces of, of story content is extremely important, especially when being faced with a player death and having to bring in a new character into a campaign. Yeah. What is it? Like, for the home game that Jackson and I play, and Jackson's my DM, actually, too, and I wasn't even an original character in that campaign. Uh, I was brought in kind of a little bit in, and Jackson had a great way of bringing me in. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, it is uh, it is very hard to lose a, a player or even a person a part of the table. I know for sure I've had, with my own personal campaign, I've run a lot of players uh not really a lot a few of the players did leave just due to scheduling conflicts and things like that and the best enemy of any ttrpg is time itself man that's just what it is it it sucks to suck man yeah the big bad is never theatron the demon lord with his armies of darkness at his disposal it's always hey can you guys play this week no Uh, okay (laughs) really what it is uh i'm bringing new players in i 
How it goes in for me is I always love introducing new people, especially to Dungeons and Dragons or any TTRPG, because I feel like it's really good way of letting people, you know, let out and like exercise things that they don't really necessarily get to on a day to day basis. And so I, I think try it's to... sorry to cut you off. I think You're it's fine. easily described as in a world where everything can be digitally accessed it's much harder to be independently creative. And when you sit down at a table yeah. and you're cl- collaboratively writing a story, it's easy to be like, hey, what if this happened? A yes. lot more so than trying to do it yourself. Exactly. I like to write middles. I'm terrible at beginnings and ends. So if somebody wants to write that beginning for me, let's go. Let's work together. Yeah. So yeah, the story is always progressing. Do you guys have any fun little ways you like to bring new characters into a world? Uh, we're convenient at this point that a lot of the the changes that we're going to be seeing are happening at the in-between session um, mm. between our first and our second book. We had a natural down point where players were able to leave and Volmo died. Let's just be real. The, the ghost was a way to keep me going. But Volmo, unfortunately, did not make it out. So we were conveniently, we were conveniently <laughs> enough granted a, a natural point for kind of a party swap up. Do you guys have any fun ways to drop people straight into the middle of a game that's ongoing? Or is it the, hey, you guys got to wait to get back to town? Your party is three levels deep in a seven level dungeon and two of them are down, do you hope that they manage to escape or do they find somebody trapped in a closet? What's your favorite way to do it? Lunar keeps laughing. I want to hear the story. (laughs) I keep laughing because of how Jackson has introduced both of the characters in our home game. He introduced, because Timothy is a part of our home game. That's why I wanted to play him because I really like him. He introduced Timothy by being like hogtied and like, captured by cultists he was like barely like clothed and he was a drunken mess as he would be and i just kept taunting people yeah these guys were trying to get to this tower that they need to fix in order to put the sun back in the sky long story there but uh they they were at this place that was currently being overrun by an enemy faction and since timothy's character is all about you know passing out and waking up in a place that he has no idea how he got there or why he's there in the first place i'm like perfect i'll just hog tie you up to a pole and then you'll wake up in suddenly an enemy territory just in time for the party to arrive at the towers see a hostage situation and want to rescue you Mm-hmm. And then the other character that we have a part of our home game, <laughs> we walk into a crypt and the first room, we're like, okay, we should be expecting some puzzles. There's a person in a cage. And yeah. we're just like, oh, oh, how'd you end up there, bud? Sacrificial <laughs> the fodder. Old, yeah. The good old person in a cage. Uh, yeah. I've witnessed that one once or twice myself. The Elder Scrolls approach. Yeah. Yeah. Rachel, Jason, favorite ways to bring people in? Yeah. So on a similar note, uh, I think the, you know, I'm trapped in the dungeon that you're currently in is pretty common. I will say a trick my dad used as, you know, as I've said many times, my first GM, he did not let us play our new characters until they party accepted them as a NPC. So you would run into someone. My dad would say, this person says, whatever, you know, act like an NPC. And that way we authentically met them, decided if we trusted them or just wanted to murder them. And, you know, you weren't just, you didn't get that weird, like, oh, of course I trust you because I know that Corey's playing them. And so I have to let them into the party, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, uh, I think we got to see a little bit of that influence with just your natural to react reaction of almost showing up and being like oh yeah there's pirates from Cheliax chasing me and they just murdered all your friends outside and i did nothing what's uh-huh. up like yeah. naturally you're not going to trust that person and i think having that dynamic's very interesting and a lot of people overlook it so i i really like it i like having that little bit of inner party tension right you're not you're not always going to be best friends 
you know, there's moments of tension and moments of softness. It's finding the balance to tell a, the story of the character you're trying to portray. Right. Believable Maybe story. Maybe I'm a little bit, I might be a little bit method in the way that uh, I become them in my head. I, I really try and like, you know, we only use what 20% of 20% of our brains. If I can access like an extra 2% just to like store this guy's memories. Perfect. It's like a, a dump memory. Cause they're going to die. We all know that's what happens to my characters. Um, so it works well. How about you, Jason favorite way to dump characters into a scene. So I have, have you guys seen the gamers by the dead gentleman? No, what is that? It's, uh, <laughs> I'll have to send you the link. So it's a uh, it's an old like indie web show from way back when. Let me let me look it up here. This was back in two thousand and Dead Gentleman Productions, two thousand and five, two thousand two. So it's back in two thousand and two. That's that's so, pre YouTube, my dude. Oh, dude. Yeah, so this was so 2002. I would have been a sophomore in college at the time, and they it was basically a group of guys that were playing D and D, and they filmed like they filmed themselves at a table, and then they would cut to like themselves as their characters, like out in the world doing their adventure, and it was just a comedy, and that, and it's kind of like. Um, tongue-in-cheek mocking not mocking but like um just make it like satire. Crack, satire of the, the you know like there's one part where he's like he's like i'm a rogue he's like okay uh, i'm gonna backstab him it's like okay roll it. it's like okay i rolled a natural 20 okay can i change that i'm gonna backstab him with a ballista he's like you're going to backstab him with a fucking ballista. And it just kind of shows him like fast forwarding, building a ballista behind this guy's <laughs> like throws him in place. But in the movie, there is a bit where they're like, okay, so you got to remember your last character died. This is a new character. And he, and you're meeting him for the first time. I really want you to role play this. You've never met this guy. You're being chased by this evil empire. And this is the first guy you've encountered. So I really want you to take that into context and role play it. And the group's like, okay, we got this. And then it cuts to the scene. He's like, hey, you look like a trustworthy fellow. Would you like to join us on our humble quest? (laughs) Sure. And so it's like, that's everything you're talking about. Just made me think of that scene. No, as far as like favorite ways to bring in new characters, I think the most organic way like you know this the simplest way is always the best way i think there's there's ways you can overcomplicate it and when you overcomplicate it it comes off as convoluted and not believable so having something simple like keep keep it simple stupid you know the kiss methodology (laughs) so okay you have a new you have a new person what would be the simplest way for them to join the party well, he was a guard in town and the guard sending and the king sending you a message. Boom. You got a new fighter in the group. It's easy. The king sending you a message. He sent his guard to find you guys there. You got a new fighter, you know, something along those lines. It's like, I don't think you need to overcomplicate this as a GM, because if you overcomplicate it and you over engineer it, it just becomes way too convoluted. And that's my at least that's the way i do it i really like that method of taking someone who is going to be involved in the story in some way being the new character like the guard delivering the message being a, a potential player character and being like Oh, hey, cool. Thanks for the message. By the way, you look strong. You want to come fight with us? We're a bunch of frail wizards that can't take a hit. <laughs> or uh, what, what? You're a cleric? Can you heal us? We've been really taking the shit. Yeah. yeah. Or like someone's like, oh, this wizard's got to know that. The wizard happens to be the new player character. It's like, oh, I don't know much about this, but I'll join you on the adventure to figure it out. My very I, first uh... character was a thief that the rest of them encountered as an NPC weeks ago. And then I wanted to play a thief, so they gave it to me. 
So this is your character. So I agree. Sometimes NPCs are naturally uh, occurring player characters that you just mm-hmm. didn't know were going to be yours someday. Yeah. And that is exactly what Steven built with the companion NPCs in book one. Mm. Good call. The dead companions. Yeah. That we got. Not murdered. all of them. Not all of them. <laughs> the Marty's still around. As far as we know. Yeah, the, the only ones that didn't survive were the two that were kind of tolerable in Rizzerk's eyes. The but fighter. he also didn't make it out of it. Yeah, the fighter and the ranger. Yeah. Yeah. Fighter well, and Kalanda druid. Was she hot. was a druid. She was a druid. Yeah. And she was hot. Which is important for an NPC, right? Of course. It That's is what we've yeah. learned. Mm-hmm. Oh, of course. Yes. Yeah, yeah, by the way, I'll, um she was pastel goth. Oh, so perfect. It's, yeah. Yes. Excellent. Just so she was also tiny. She was uh yeah. she was a what foot is tall the species? Pixie. It's, uh a pixie. Yeah. A they sprite. Had, oh, yeah. Sprite. Special sprite. name, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, so they were a sprite, but it was a a new heritage. Okay. No. Galtagori. 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 Okay. Yeah. Galtagori. Oh, there, go. there you go. You get a good Galt- bo- you get a good boy point. Yeah. Galtagori sprite. That's right. That's an They're essay about a so word if I've ever heard it. <laughs> yeah. I'm a I'm a big fan. I've got two ways I like to drop players into my games depending on the mood and the atmosphere. If it's something that's really tense, I like mystical tubes to open in the roof and drop them directly onto the floor, taking 1d6 of damage immediately. And that's that. That's if Welcome something more fast paced. Yeah, it's it's common knowledge that sometimes ancient magic drops people places. I'll say sure. that. No questions. There's no detect magic needed to, hey, this person fell from the sky. Deal with it. The other way I'm a big fan isekai, of Isekai, right? That's yeah, Isekai. Yeah, pretty much. It's essentially that. It's a, it's a really common move when playing Paranoia, which is where I really cut Ooh. my teeth early with role-playing games, is you just drop clones from the ceiling. So that's something that's always stuck with me. And then my other way is, for some reason, it's really foggy when you're camping at night sometimes, and people are traveling, and they stumble across your, your camp. It's simple. And you know what? Sometimes that person dies because wolves attack that same night on a bad encounter roll and they get confused right away and they attack your barbarian and then your barbarian crits them and they don't last a single session, but it feels right. <laughs> Woof. Yeah. I've witnessed a lot of player or a lot of player deaths at this point. Um, several of which are mine. <laughs> I've learned, I've learned from them. And Badge that's what this game is about. Have you? Have no. <laughs> Volmo got swallowed by a slime and couldn't do anything. Wizard oh, got killed him. by a breath weapon by another dragon, a littler dragon than him. I, I don't think I've learned anything other than don't drown. Because characters <laughs> can drown in puddles. Things. Characters yeah. can dr- drown in puddles, puddles. And if you ask if the map is accurate and the GM says yes, be careful where you go unconscious. Rest in you peace. S- <laughs> you said clones in there. Have ever any of you ever run into the stereotypical person that just wants to play the exact same character, but like changes the name? Like I'm John the brother the second. of yeah. Oh yes. I have not personally. <laughs> no, but I, know I am it's not. A thing. I am yeah. not Bill. I am his cousin Bob. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, Conveniently, I've encountered know everything. It in games once uh, with the guy who died and played. The guy's two twin brothers. Uh, it was like a, a fighter, barbarian, monk kind of thing, but mm-hmm. all the same backstory and all that. Just like one came to avenge his first brother, and then the third one came to avenge his two other brothers kind of thing. <laughs> and it was whatever. But I will admit to have being that person at one point. The original Rizzerk, my my sweet, sweet bird, Rizzerk originally was an Oracle Inquisitor build Whoa. that died. And shortly after his death, I actually brought in the sister, which was a, a plague druid who was very angry at Rizzerk for leaving the nest, more or less. And that was that was the end of it. Found out Rizzerk was dead and stayed with the party because, well, shit, that was kind of my whole point. But I've never pushed it to the point with a shared backstory. We've yeah. all heard of the the infamous John story, I believe it is, where it was John the 17th and people, 
people didn't want to play with this guy at a game shop because every time he showed up with a new reincarnation of the same character um, and it didn't matter what system or anything like that. And uh, something that's always lived in the back of my mind, at least. See, I'm a fan of the multiverse theory and characters where you can have one character that exists in different campaigns that are in no way connected to another because they're all in their separate cosmic energy and everything. Yeah. But typically whenever I have a player die and like if I have a character of mine die and I'm re-rolling a new character for the same campaign, I go like, okay, I was a half-orc barbarian. All right, now I'm a rock gnome wizard. Mm. <laughs> Just mm-hmm. complete 180. I don't think I've had a character die on me. Knock on wood, right? Like, especially Jason now. Jason fix that. Yeah, like Jason's <laughs> going to fix that. I can't wait. I'm going to eventually just slip and fall on some like broken glass from a whiskey bottle and be like, that's the end of Timothy, man. God, I won't say much. I, I, <laughs> I haven't seen much behind the curtain, but the little tidbits that I've managed to sneak out of Jason kind of hint at things maybe going up in, in level a little bit, as we've been seeing as this goes forward. So as the difficulty increases, so does the lethality. Good. Which is always, always fun. So just remember to stick on your feet. And hope that somebody's a healer, because I've done that twice, and now I'm not. Um, (laughs) But that's not important at this time. Um, Okay, so we've talked character deaths. We've talked bringing new people to the table. Is there anything else that you think we should talk in this vein, Jason? Or, Or Rachel? Or the open floor? Yeah, I mean, Jackson and and Luna are, are GMs as well, so... I think um I think one of the things what we what we should talk about too is something that's very very important is table chemistry because yes. I think that when bringing in new players the table chemistry needs to be there. You don't mm-hmm. want to bring in a player who isn't going to vibe with yeah. the table. And I mean being completely honest here, there are different tables that play different ways. You know, you can have the table that is very role play heavy Mm -hmm. and you can have the table who they just really like rolling dice and playing a, you know, microscopic mini version of a war game. Living in the crunch. That's what they like to do. They like to war game, but as individuals instead of troops. And Mm -hmm. I've played, I've played and I've GM'd with both, with both styles. So... I think it's important to make sure that when you bring in new players that you that they understand the type of vibe that you're going for for that particular table. So when Jackson and Lunar were joining our table, I had a one on one meeting with both of them explaining, hey, you know, our table is going to be very. You know, we're going to lean heavier on the role play side that it's going to be like 60, 70 percent role play with the uh, with the rest of it being more combat grittiness. I mean, it is Pathfinder, so there is the crunch, there is the dice and there is the combat and some episodes are nothing but combat. But even in the combat, there's some role playing yeah. in there. Well, and once again, I just have to speak for how great second edition Pathfinder's been for, I played a lot of very crunchy first edition, like microcosm crunchy. And second edition has been really great at streamlining that. And I'm not seeing 15 to 20 minute turns out of people sorting through abilities. The three action system and that kind of thing has been really great so far. That being said, we're progressing to those higher levels where we may see more of that crunch start to appear, but the streamlining seems to be really efficient and effective. Yeah. And I think speaking to that, because I played in a high level adventure where, you know, it was level 17 to level 19 adventure, the, the turn orders, they don't take as long. It's just you have to prep. You have to prep between your turns because at that level, you got to have the flow chart ready. Yeah. Yeah. At that level, you have so many more feats, which give you so many more different actions that your character can do. 
but you still ultimately can only do three actions. So it's not like you're taking longer. You're still just doing three actions on your turn. So your turn kind of stays the same. It's just, you have so many more options available to you on what to do. And that that's where it's like, okay, between my turn, I need to look, okay, well, I need to pay attention to what's going on. And then based off of what's going on, react to and pick my, but either way, getting off topic here, I think <laughs> the, the vibe at the table is really important. So making sure that when you're bringing in a new player, that both the player and the character is going to fit that. And yeah. I think, the, I think the player needs to fit it. A, they need to understand that what type, what type of table you're playing at, mm-hmm. because if you're bringing in somebody who wants to basically play a miniature war game into a table, that's like 75, 80% role-playing, they're not going to have a good time. Same vice versa too. It's not, you're not going to, they're not going to mesh. And at the same time, the characters also need to need to vibe. Like if you if, if everybody's playing back a uh, backline spellcasters, your new player, I don't know if they want they should be playing another backline spellcaster. I mean, I'm never gonna tell a player don't play what you want to play. But if you want to have a good time, Pathfinder 2 is all about teamwork. It's not yeah. the it's not the power fantasy that fi- that fifth edition is. Fifth edition is very much a power fantasy game where one character, it's like a basketball game where one player can like run a game and take over a game. Same thing and with just fifth elders edition. blast their way to level 14. Fifth edition, yeah. one, one well built warlock can just take over a game. Pathfinder is not that. Pathfinder is all about teamwork. And if you don't have the right teamwork and you're not playing as a team you're gonna have a bad time yeah so it's just like you got to make sure that they understand that and that you're building a a party composition that is going to complement that teamwork so i think that's 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 a point i don't know if any of you anybody any of you four have any comment on on like bringing in a new player or bringing in a new character when it comes to like table vibe I think there's a few different subtopics there, right? I'd be curious how you all... So I fall into groups. I don't create groups. I have a friend who knows a friend, and then I just join the group a couple sessions in because I don't like making friends. But have you all put together like groups from scratch? How do you figure out uh, party comp or player composition? Yeah, so what is it with me personally... I have friends that are like, you know, I've never played a TTRPG before, but I've always wanted to. And like, those are a bunch of like, like my close friends and we hang out already as is. And I'm like, you know what? I think they would mesh good together. And it definitely has proven to be the case with like some of the one shots that I've ran and some of the, uh, my, my campaigns that I've been a part of. Uh, and then I'm lucky enough to where if I don't know somebody, my significant other Jackson will be like, hey, you want to like play Dungeons and Dragons with like new nerds? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? That seems fun. Do I get to bully them? And then he's like, yes. And I'm like, cool. Excellent. Just let me sign up right now. <laughs> and you just kind of, I guess, work with the vibe with with my tables, especially how I like to do it is I'm very comedy forward. Because I do like, you know, making sure everyone has a good time. Because at the end of the day, no matter what game, no matter what system you're playing, you got to have a good time, man. Because, like, it sucks when you're, like, in the middle of this fight and you look over to one of your players and they are just like, I'm bored. I don't want to do this. Ah!" (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, I get it, man. The, The wizard's casting 50 million spells and is going on his power trip it's fine we'll get to you and then it's like and i killed the person it's like well shit never mind (laughs) yeah but i've i've been on the back end where i've rolled last in initiative like well i'm not fighting this combat (laughs) yeah exactly so so you sorry to interject 
do either of you have any experience with Pathfinder or first or second edition? I played like no. a session of Pathfinder first edition. It was not explained well to me. So that okay. knowledge yeah. is gone. J- well, Jason. I'll, I'll say I, I came over from not playing Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder at all. I started on the other world, uh, dipped my toes in 5e at first and then moved over to Pathfinder because I found that while there's a lot of crunch sometimes, Mm -hmm. you also get a lot more variety in what you can do and who you can be um, within the world. So uh, it's, it's, it's fun. I think you guys are in for a real treat going forwards here. I'm glad that we get to introduce you to the world of Pathfinder. Oh, I'm excited. As we kind of explore it here on the, in the Indigo Isles. Yeah. I'm, I've been super excited. Uh, I like when I was talking with Jason, I was like, Hey, full disclosure. I don't know what I'm going to be doing. I am here to present goofs and comedy and alleviate silly situations. Uh, But I, I humbly ask that everyone be patient with both me and Jackson as we are still very much learning the system and we are trying our best. Uh, Pobody's nerfed, am I right? Hey, let's go. <laughs> That's very correct. Yeah. It's all right. You'll do fine. If, uh, if Jason can teach me the rules, uh, <laughs> I'm sure I've got it. And well, Rachel and Jason have had the other rules imprinted in their brains for so long that picking up new ones, uh, it's, it's like waiting through TT RPG soup. I imagine sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, between, between the two of them, I'm, I'm pretty confident they'll be able to guide us all in the right direction. Hey, there you go. Then. Yeah. Right. And, and in a couple months, we'll all be learning the new, a new terminology anyway, when the remaster comes out. That's Whoa. true. That's true. Because I'm because we're not going to be able to use flat footed or attack of opportunity or magic missile or Wait, mage hand is copyrighted under OGL. Yeah, yeah. Nope. it's not even in 5e. What the That's heck? Stupid. I'm going to say <laughs> okay. it. it's called it's not it's not flat footed anymore. It's called um, surprise. No, no. Uh, off guard. It's called off guard now. An attack of opportunity is now called reactive strike. And that telekinetic sounds cooler though. It does. Te- our our mage hand is now called telekinetic hand. I'm no. loading up Final Fantasy 14. Like this is that's what it feels like. I'm listening to Final Fa- Final Fantasy 14 commands as I'm yeah. like, so that's, It's really that's cool though. Pretty much where we're going, yeah. Fuck yeah. So I'm I think against- um I was Go ahead, just Rachel. Say, I'm against using real names for things anyway, so we're just going to keep calling them random things and hope we all understand <laughs> what we're talking about. So I'm going to, oh yeah, everything's going to be flavored from here on. We're getting yeah. espresso yeah. flavored strikes. So, I mean, we had to, we had to, Rachel and I had to learn how to not say tensors floating disc mm-hmm. back in the day and just go to floating disc. Yeah. And now we're going to have to call floating disc something else. I don't know what it's going to be called now. I mean, I didn't have to make the transition. I just played first edition D&D and then jumped way ahead. So the transition was lost to me. But yes. So you didn't even have to you didn't even have to use tensors. I mean, yeah. There there were things. Again, I don't call things by their real names. I call things by approximate names and hope people understand me. So. Magic frisbee. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 the I, thing. I really I really want Rachel's next character to be a wizard all of a sudden. <laughs> so much. I can't. Yeah, you're going to be a red a, a red wizard of Thrun? No. Oh, wait, wait. We can't use that. We can't use that. <laughs> blue, blue wizard of... Ayun. Ayun. Yeah, nope, no. Ayun's not, not, not Pathfinder either. Just a blue, blue wizard, wizard of, of, D's. of uh, the, uh, the, the Johnsonville. We'll figure it. We'll find something. Yeah. I'm sure there's yeah. blue wizards somewhere. I'm just gonna mutter something at the end of that. Yeah, like exactly. I just did with <laughs> Yeah, uh, you yeah. just mutter it, and it, every single time hey. someone's like, "What? What did you mean?" It's like, "Don't oh, worry yeah, about it." Oh yeah, that's that's what that's you said. The yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. yeah, we got there. That's all that matters. Yeah, mm-hmm. I cast. Never <laughs> miss the referral. Yes. The first level spell that shoots out darts. <laughs> I mean, it, we use Foundry, so I click the button and it pops it up. I don't have to remember things. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. I, I cast, cast this, this button. Rachel, so the audience can't hear what this is. What I do you cast? I do it is. Still no. 
what they'll figure it out and did, did they die or not right yeah, exactly <laughs> That actually brings me to something I spend a lot of time thinking about. It's one of my favorite things when I DM or GM uh, is I'm a big fan of set ambiance. Do you guys have any tricks for helping absorb your players into a table? Music. Is it yeah. Carefully selected yeah. music. Is it just tone and keeping things moving at a certain pace? Is there a certain trick that you like to use? I, oh yeah, go ahead, Jackson. Music is a great one, as as Lunar called out earlier. But uh, one of my favorites is environmental storytelling. Describing the scene as it's playing out from a very, uh, very like a high level perspective. Like I mentioned earlier, the uh, campaign where the sun fell out of the sky. The <laughs> context behind that is that the sun has been up in the sky for 10,000 years at a glorious high noon for everybody's entire lifetime, their parents' lifetime, their parents' parents' lifetime, even if you're an elf. And one day when you look up and you see the sun starting to set, that causes that, that basically to the common man is an apocalypse. So when I introduced that particular conflict and to set the theme of how the story was supposed to be told, it was like peasants running left and right, trying to find their loved ones, uh, alarm bells going off all over the town, people just freaking out, mass panic. Uh, some stores getting looted as well as people were just basically thinking "Oh, the end is here. Time to go crazy. And then in another situation, too, I've had it where I have used environmental foreshadowing to basically foreshadow how a f how strong a fight is going to be where a group of characters were getting ready to fight a vampire at the at the top of his little fortress and they came into a room where the vampire knew that they were coming and drained the blood of every single one of their servants so that way they had enough strength to fight the party and that was never explicitly said. It was just you come across this room and you see piles of exsanguinated corpses all over the place, sunken eyes, looks of fear, confusion and pain as you come across multiple of these bodies. You still see the stairs ahead of you leading up further into the tower, but this is the scene as it's laid before you. For me... I, I do like the music. I don't use music on the podcast for obvious reasons. Yeah. Because th I'll, I'll save that for the actual like post-production stuff. I don't want to... A, I don't want to chew up bandwidth with our VTT just because, you know, we have somebody in Canada. We have two folks down in Texas now. It's just I don't want to use up too much bandwidth. And, I, and I'm already using a shit ton of modules in Foundry. So I'm already using up quite a bit. But but in my games that I don't run on the, on podcast, um, I do use music. And one of the things that, and Rachel has experienced this, is um, in addition to my other, some of the other tricks of the trade that I've developed, I, there's a module called hype tracks, which is really, really awesome. Basically during combat, each PC will have their own theme song playing. So when it's that PC's turn in the initiative order, it'll automatically flip to that MP3 and play that PC's particular theme song while they take their turn in combat. I think that adds a bit of, um, a bit of a visceral element, a bit of a spotlight to that PC and to the player. It's like, all right, oh shit, it's go time. Like, you know, it's like, like you're like, you're a WWE professional wrestler. And, you know, you hear the undertaker's theme. It's like, oh shit, it's go time. Now takers coming out. So it's like your PC's turn is, is there. The other thing that I like to do and Corey and Rachel have both experienced this is, I like to use MP, uh, NPCs and I really like to give my NPCs unique voices. And 
I don't do a whole lot of accents, but I like using, I like playing with tone and I like playing with uh, pitch with my voice. And so, especially in an audio medium, I really like it because it allows me to establish a rapport and establish a connection with the audience and that particular NPC. So, and in this AP, especially because NPCs are very important in this AP and they will come back in, in later books. So NPCs they met in book one will come back in book two and will come back in book three. So having those established voices is really important, um, but it adds a sense of immersion and it allows both the players and the audience to connect a voice that I've done with an NPC. So that's another, that's another immersion tool. Rachel. Uh, skip to Corey. <laughs> I, or I'm Lunar. a big fan. What? Oh, sorry. Or Lunar. Or Lunar, yeah. Sorry, I, I'm not going to lie. I've been yawning a little bit. Not because I'm bored, generally because I'm like, man, I'm like sleepy. I was walking out in the sun all day. It was, oof. Texas heat, man, it sucks right now. Oh, We're yeah, in an it's... odd, awful heat way. It's over 100 here, easy. It sucks. I mean, personally with me, I really love using character voices because I'd like to think, hey, it's fun to do those. Uh, music, especially, like I said, is huge at my table as well, too, because I think it's really good for theming and things like that. I like doing character art of... And like kind of like world telling art as well, too, of maybe certain big battles that are happening, like boss fights. I told Jason this, but the home campaign that I was with for Jackson when I was running it, they went to a place called the Mystery Flesh Pit. And it was... That sounds fun. Oh, my God. I could talk about how I built that like a while because it how I brought them there because they are in like the Fandelver like this was originally in. D and D five E, and I told them that they were told to go to this area, and they heard some weird mishaps with like artifacts and stuff like that. And so they started walking into a forest, and then the next thing they knew, they stumbled into Odessa, Texas, and there was technology and people that they've never seen before, and mechanical beasts that none had ever seen before, and a Chili's too, and an IMAX. Ooh, terrifying. Uh, capitalism. <laughs> the scariest monster of them all. Of course. <laughs> My shortly lived cleric of Abadar shakes in her grave in excitement. <laughs> and then as I had them get introduced, people would go up to him and be like, oh, man, nice costume. Because that same exact time they had a Comic-Con going on. So everyone blended in perfectly. But then as they went in, they found out that this was actually a a national park where a part of the world in actual Earth has a giant meat hole. And it's called the Mystery Flesh Pit. Did I mention that this campaign was also horror based too? <laughs> oh. And so they actually went in and they had really big stakes happening to them. And it slowly turned from goofs and funny times to you feel like you're being watched as you are making your ways through these crevices and caves that are not man are not made of mortal, like normal man-made things. And you feel the skin like on your back crawling as you're touching things no mortal should ever be touching and you just feel in the back of your head the entire time this ain't right this isn't it no i don't like this but it's how you describe things and how you build character voices and how everything gets built up and built up and built up to when you have that really great moment and players are really good at taking that scene that you have been building up and making it 10 times better. It's always the coolest thing when a player does something that I wasn't expecting them to do and it just makes it 10 times better. It's it's so cool. Uh, 
At least so that's my you're take. saying, so you're saying there were big stakes in Texas. Yes, there were big old stakes in Texas. Wagyu cuts. <laughs> Wonderful. Some real fine meat working there. You can buy those at Chili's too. <laughs> yeah, buy those at Chili's too. Watch Spider Verse at the IMAX while you eat your Wagyu beef. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, Texas like, sounds yeah. like a strange place. Texas is an anomaly. We live I'm gonna here. Stay, and I'm going to stay in my little mountain town for now. It's a good call. Yeah, we're a mountain town, man. Don't come down here. It's not a we good place. We have state. places like Voodoo Donuts, and you can go there at 2 a.m. and get go to the bar next door and go get like drunk. Yeah, yeah, we got a sh- we got two a.m. shawarma. That's that's all right. See, but like voodoo donuts, man, that hits different at when you are yeah. at your peak drunkenness. I could imagine that's, that's true, but the population base that's required to have the access to that makes me shiver. Oh, fair for myself. <laughs> I'll keep my my favorite ways to keep things simple. I've mentioned once or twice to I think most people, I've never played a game in person. I am your purely digital player. Everything has been done through video chats like this. So my favorite way is much like everybody else. I'll run music for the game itself, or even times like now I'm running music to keep my tempo in the way that I speak and the way that I build ambiance as things build in the music. I talk faster. I can resonate deeper. And just by changing tempo in the way you speak, it adds a sense of urgency, especially if you normally describe at a generally methodical pace. So using your silence or the absence of silence in rapid speech can be something that's very effective. Uh, Something else I really like is as a video guy, I play with my lights a lot. Yeah. You're fighting at night. Something bad goes (laughs) on. The lights go red. You get close, you turn the lights down even lower. If it, they're fighting in a cave, this light strip doesn't have it for a little while. I was running some weird code I was working on um, to make custom RGB flash patterns, depending on what it was for torch light, camp, campfires. If somebody triggered a lightning bolt, it would flash white light behind me. Um So using lighting in a digital aspect is something that can also really help, especially if your players are watching you as you talk. Um, Not necessarily as important when you're a player, but it can still help you kind of get in that mindset. And a lot of it for me is just falling into the place that you can engage. And if you're engaging and your players are likely going to be engaging as well, everybody's just there to have a good time, like we've mentioned. So that engagement, I think, is kind of the goal if everybody's engaged and there and present you're probably having a good time you don't need to stress to piggyback off of the thing that you were talking about how like when you describe things you would change away how you're narrating like starting off like methodical for like a very mundane explanation but then speeding up really fast whenever something really massive or really bad is going to happen i am a big fan of taking a set expectation of this is how I narrate and then applying it to a situation that doesn't seem like it needs it in order to kind of subtly communicate. You see, you see a rabbit coming out of the cave. Its eyes are red. And as you you see, like it's licking its lips, there are corpses littered everywhere, but it's just a little bunny rabbit. What are you going to do? Like the fast talking is like, okay, the DM is, telling me there's danger but it's a rabbit is this thing gonna leap at my throat and kill me monty python style uh, (laughs) we've all seen holy grail we know what you're doing yeah it's it's the vocal egg timer effect i guess you could almost call it um and i think that's something that's a lot of fun to play around with especially if you're into it jeez i think i think there's real quick i know that we're, we're wrapping up on time one of the things i like to do and hopefully I mean, Corey and Rachel, you can tell me if it if this comes across well enough. Is I like to practice reading the flavor text so it doesn't come off like I'm reading it. Mm-hmm. You know how when when you can tell when folks are reading. So one of the things I like to do is a <clears throat> is when I'm reading the flavor text of a room, or when I'm about to, I 
like I think while well, we're all DMs or GMs here, so yeah. we know that like the day, the night before or the hour or the day before or the hour before we're playing, we generally read over the encounters that are going to happen. And so I like to practice reading the flavor text because I don't want it to come off like I'm reading. I'd, I'd rather have it come off in my regular normal speech pattern instead of... It feels weird if it's the DM's first time reading the flavor text. In exactly. Game. Yeah, exactly. I, I 100% what you're, get what you're saying there, Jason. And I, and I hope that when... I hope, and listeners, you guys can tell me too. Like, on the podcast... And and for my players, I hope that that comes off because that's something that I, I'm really trying to work on, and I kind of like to think I pride myself on being able to convey that. And I mean, I usually tell people, okay, so here's what the flavor text says, and I just say it, but I try not to make it come off like I'm reading it to have it come off fairly naturally. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and you it, like it, to it, elaborate too, right? Like you reiterate yeah. or re-describe things I, in your I, own yeah, words. I, I, often, I'll, I'll, mm. I'll rephrase what they mm-hmm. what what the what the flavor text actually says. Like the gist of it's there. You'll humanize it. Seventy yeah, that's a good word about for it. sixty to seventy percent of the words are what they are, mm. but I'll like I'll take it and I'll tweak it and i'll just kind of rephrase it yeah. make it my own like i wouldn't say it this way i jason would say it like this and that's and so i would say it that way yeah yeah i think you do it very differently and it's a different tone but i definitely go the other way that i just use sarcasm surprisingly and you know <laughs> sarcastically lean into the box text and then flip back out but I'm not recording a podcast when I GM. So, you know, I like that you but do no, it more you, naturally for this. So You have your own style and it works it, like in your Abomination Vaults game. It <laughs> works for your game. Right. No, that's And that's yeah. your style. And yeah. it's very much a Rachel game and it's and it's your style. and Lots of sarcasm, I, lots of lying to my players. Yeah, of course. Well, my I think lots of, I think lots of teasing. Lots right. of teasing. You have which to. Is great. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that's uh, it's interesting because every every person has their own style when they're running a game. I my goal is I want to figure out what is going to emotionally connect each player to their character, and then figure out how I can use that to draw real emotion from each player. If I can make you cry without killing somebody you love in the game, I'm doing my job right. Because it means that we've reached a connection, and this is something that's actually important to you. Oh, but because of that, I run, with you. <laughs> I, I run games very differently when I run them, of course. Uh, because of that, things like D&D and Pathfinder aren't naturally the fit for them a lot of the time. Because while they're great, they're not necessarily the, the cinegraphic gameplay I like. I often GM from the standpoint of somebody sitting in a movie theater watching the premiere of a movie and everything you're seeing is the angle of the camera as it's being portrayed to the people watching it. And that is a a different flavor altogether than actively destroying or describing what's happening in the time to your players and finding those flavors in the games that it works for is a fun adventure. And I think that's the really key thing is just got to remember to have fun. It's, it's an adventure. It's a creative outlet. It doesn't always have to be serious, but it can be. And there's nothing wrong with that. Why not both? Yeah, it's a game. Why not both have fun? I want the soft taco and the hard taco. Let's go. Yes, please. Give me one of those fucked up tacos from Taco Bell. (laughs) Yeah, where they have both of them in one. Yeah. 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 I forget what they call it, like a gordita crunch or something like that. And then wrap it in a pizza. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, yeah, calzone it. Whoa, <laughs> calzone it. Whoa, it's the Mexican pizza from Taco Bell. Don't get it. And then, twisted. And then we don't have those the, here. Oh, dang. Then you put that pizza in the Ziploc bag and you cover it with nacho cheese. Like shake why? it. Wait, why Wait. the bag? Yeah, like no, it's an yeah, no, yeah, like it's an SNL it. bit. Oh, <laughs> uh, Andy, Andy Samberg. Like I, I was, I, I was I genuinely <laughs> invested in this. <laughs> we took, we took a hard shell taco. I'm hungry. I haven't eaten today. Like we took a hard shell taco, we wrapped it in a soft shell taco. 
We took that, we wrapped it in a pita. We took that, we wrapped <laughs> it in a pizza. We took that, we wrapped it. And it just goes on and on. I'll have to Taco find the version That's... of a turducken. Oh my I'll god. Have... So I gotta I gotta send you guys the gamers and I gotta send you guys that SNL bit. Okay. Yes. I'm yeah. on Before it. Yeah, I'm on it. A little yeah. bit of a list. Close yeah. it. I'm, I'm right. on it. Okay. So any important notes you guys want to get in before I wrap us up here tonight? Have fun. TTRPGs are all about having fun, man. Bring in people that you think will have a good time and good vibe with your group. Award the rule of cool, too. That's what I always say. Abide by the rule of cool. What's the rule of cool? The rule of cool. Doesn't matter if it makes sense. If it's cool, go for it. Yeah. That's basically it. basically in Pathfinder 2E is you get a hero point. That's I how see. you award the you, that's legitimately how you award the the rule of cool. It's yeah. always fun. Yeah, there's it's always good when there's mechanics to reward players and thankfully our GM remembers to use them as many often don't. Uh, Inspiration in 5E so, is also a way to do that. Yes. 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 I think the main point I'm walking away with is that if I Corey ever GMs to get prepared for emotional torture, so I'm looking <laughs> oh, forward to that one day. I yeah. I just want people to connect. That's why. So that Jason you can and I have talked. Yeah. I want them to cry. Yeah. <laughs> I I want you to feel joy, and I want you to feel sadness. I want if I can give you a sense of awe somehow, then I have far exceeded anything I expected to accomplish. <laughs> and that's my goal is to exceed what I thought I could accomplish because I love telling stories, but, uh, Oh, where was I going to go with this? So, yeah, we've covered a bit of a spectrum of topics everywhere from the unfortunate and all too common loss of players at a table, the journey of finding new players and how to kind of establish the vibe and make sure they're the right fit for what you're looking to do so everybody can have fun and the fact that you can just have fun with it sometimes you can be serious and practical and have your players encounter every new pc they meet several times in the future in the form of an npc to build trust or you can have them drop out of the sky or found in a cage randomly throughout a dungeon there really isn't a wrong way to do it. But if you think there is, get at me on Discord. I'll fight with you. I don't care. You know <laughs> my username. Down. This is Corey. I'm the closet prophet. I'm always online that red dot just so I don't get notifications when I'm not clicked on Discord. But it's open. It's there. I can see your messages. So meet yeah, Corey get at in the me. Thunderdome. I'm ready for the fight. <laughs> yeah. And otherwise, just remember to have fun. Eat some yeah. cereal. It's good for you and tasty. And <laughs> We'll see you really soon with something new. <laughs> I hope your party never ends. Eat some cereal. <laughs> <laughs>